Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Joe Bailey, who will give tonight's President's Lecture. Particularly pleasant for me to do so, because um, it's so long since we've actually had a President do a President's Lecture. <laughs> I cannot actually remember the last President who did. So it's something which um, is uh, I've been of great interest to Joe, I know, and she'll be telling you a bit about the role of the field club and how they uh, in the early years of the 20th century, prevented the loss of many important buildings, particularly, I think, in Southampton. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Yes, I will be concentrating on Southampton, saving Southampton's monuments, and but what role did the Hampshire Field Club really play? Um, the question first began to interest me, uh, when we, the Hampshire Field Club's uh, council, were discussing the role that the Hampshire Field Club should or could play these days to act as an advocate for Hampshire's heritage. I suppose, like anyone in, with my kind of background, and, and which I share with many of you, working in museums and heritage, you inevitably reflect on how things have been done in the past when you're considering about how things could or should be done in the future. I'd also just started working for Southampton City Council as Monuments and Memorials Officer and was coming across references to the Hampshire Field Club in old documents discussing the future of some of the city's finest monuments. I was f familiar with some of the cases, um, having read Beth Taylor's excellent article on the history of the Field Club that was written to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Field Club. Um, but there were some that were new to me. And then when I reread the article, there were more there than she mentioned that I'd forgotten about. So I thought uh, this looked like an interesting topic. The club was actually founded in Southampton in 1885, and many of its founders were based there. So it's, it's not surprising that they became so involved in protecting the town's heritage. Um, I was aware they'd been involved in campaigns to save the bar gate and some sections of the town walls, particularly on the western side, but there was also the Undercroft um, and Westgate Hall, as it's known now, which used to be the Tudor Merchants Hall, um, but there's more. Um, I'm just attempting to change the slide. Yes, sorry about that delay in transmission there. Um, and then more recently, I've been doing some research into the Way House in French Street um, at the bottom of town. This is what it looked like uh, last autumn when we took off that uh, red netting that has been, it's been shrouded in for about four years, I think now to stop bits of rock falling into the school playground, which it had the tendency to do for a few years. Um, this is a 13th century building. Um, and it's, um, I was having to do the research because it was one of the first monuments to benefit from the city's heritage repair program that has just started. Um, it's being conserved at the moment and uh, will soon be reopening to the public after having been barriered off for um, nearly six years, I think. This case in particular, this research, uh, has really given me uh, new insights into who was involved in saving Southampton's monuments over the years, uh, not least through a visit to the um, archive held by the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Uh, they have a, a wonderful sort of archive of their case notes in their headquarters in London, and it, this project gave me the excuse to go and visit it for the first time. I should say at this point, I am going to focus on the monuments in the old medieval town of Southampton. Um, the Field Club was involved in debates about many other buildings in the town, uh, such as Bitten Manor, South Stoneham House, Millbrook Church. There's not time to consider all those as well this evening. Um, and I would just like to point out on this map, 
here with the pointer, the cursor. Um, I'll be particularly referring to this corner of the western walls, um, the bar gate there, which now feels like it's at the bottom of the town, but of course in medieval times it was the north gate. Um, the undercroft, which is, I've lost my cursor, there we go, um, is there, probably the nicest vaulted cellar that there is in the town, um, just north of the Tudor House Museum, which is there. So if you're coming out of the museum, look up the road, it's just up there on the corner, um, opposite the, what's currently called the Titanic Inn. Used to be? Mm, last further up. Uh, the Crown, I think, at one stage. No, Queen's. Anyway. This isn't a talk about pubs. Um, that could be another night. And then um, uh, the Way House, which I've already shown you a picture of, is down here on the eastern side of French Street, which isn't on this map. Whoops. Um, because that map was dated to 1904. And at that stage, the Antiquarians of Southampton knew nothing about it. Well, nothing was published about it anyway. So, um, the Field Club, perhaps alarmed by the demolition of this wonderful house, the Westgate House, uh, which used to run along the, the line of the Western Walls. Um, these days, if it was still there, it would have a fine view of the Holiday Inn, I think, mm -hmm. and to one side, the, the what was the De Vere Hotel, and... Uh, to the other, the um, cooties, um, but it has came down in 1898 at the same time as they started to demolish other bits of the Western walls. Um, and there were also threats to the bar gate at this stage. And the field club rapidly developed a strategy, although only it had been only in existence, what, 13 years. They developed a strategy very quickly that proved, I think, very effective. And I will argue, laid the foundations for saving wholesale destruction of the monuments after the war. Several people have claimed that post-war reconstruction did far less damage to medieval archeology span in Southampton than in many other comparable British towns and cities. But more of that later. So what was going on at the end of that century that got them so concerned? Um, the town council was desperate to improve the quality of housing in the old town. It had become very overcrowded, um, slum-like conditions, it, it, it was very unsanitary. Um, so they were looking for ways to clear those slums and uh, build new housing. Terraced housing, I think, was mainly what they were aiming to do. Um, the town was growing rapidly as the docks flourished and every nook and cranny within that south and west corner of the town, this, this painting, for example, shows you how all the, the buildings were um, crammed in up against the, the remains of the town walls. Um, they needed to clear them and rebuild. And the space left by the Westgate house when that was taken down must have been very tempting. It had had gardens on either side of the wall. So um, if they cleared the remains of the town wall that run right up the center of this wonderful house, they left it there uh, temporarily, they would have a massive plot. Um, and as well as it would also provide space for the new road that they wanted to build on the outside of the town wall, which we now know as Western Esplanade. So as soon as they became aware of the threat to the town walls where Westgate House had stood, if you see on the sort of the then picture here, um, the brother's sort of grainy photograph, that that was the gap that was left when they removed that beautiful house and um, the sort of bit of the town wall surviving underneath it. Um, they called a meeting, the field club called a meeting, wrote a resolution and sent it to every member of the council. 
And when you read that model, that letter now, it really is a model letter. It's the kind of thing that um, advocates for heritage, it's, it's a sort of, if you followed the advice on the CBA website on how to write, uh, make the case for heritage, it's the kind of letter that they wrote. It said things like, um, uh, it was all about creating a sense of place for local people and visitors, an opportunity to form an open space of great beauty and attraction. Um, if you left the town walls in their place and didn't build on the gardens. They even expressed in terms of economic impact and tourism, um, the, the, the walls must be saved at this time when much is being done to advertise the beauties and historic features of Southampton. And then they said they made the economic case as well and said, or financial case, and said it wouldn't actually cost very much to leave the wall up. Um, and in terms of heritage importance, they said uh, it was not merely of local but national interest. The walls must be saved. They contacted the Society of Antiquaries, arranged for their assistant secretary to meet with the mayor and attend a council meeting. Um, and they managed to influence the members of the council to the extent that they voted against the estates committee's proposal to clear the site and build on it. And it was defeated by an overwhelming majority. Um, and then they managed to persuade them to restore the wall. And that's what we've got in the now photograph here. Uh, they rebuilt three arcades that had been cleared to build Westgate House. Uh, so they did some uh, restoration work there as well. And they also agreed to do repairs to sections further north. The campaigners didn't stop there. After this success, um, the Society of Antiquaries, the Assistant Secretary, a St. John Hope, uh, gave a talk to, to, to his society using lantern slides made in Southampton. So the Hampshire Field Club even put a presentation pack together um, for, for them to continue to make the case. And a lot of this work was done on by one of the key activists, William Dale. Um, and he attended that meeting so that he could take notes and get them published in the local papers. And in fact, they sent them to lots of papers. But the version I saw was in the Southampton Times. And the talk was published by the Society of Antiquaries. And so they were promoting the importance of Southampton's antiquities to a national audience. So having saved and restored this stretch of the Western Walls, they agreed not to build on the Westgate houses back garden as well. Um, and it's, it's still to this day an open space, which is rather nice. Here we have a picture of William Dale. Um, warning to Philippa here, he was honorary secretary for 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> but he he was um really was the energy behind this strategy and a, a, a fearsome networker i think he went up to london every, every volume of the proceedings mentions him going to london to various meetings he would go to the congress of the archaeological societies which i think was the predecessor of the cba um and what became the cba but it, um, and he also gave lectures at the British Museum. He was a coin specialist and an antiquarian, of, published lots of a variety of different articles in the proceedings. Um, so anyway, yes, he was networking furiously, no doubt taking every opportunity to emphasize the importance of Southampton's heritage and Hampshire's heritage as well. It wasn't just confined to Southampton. Um, so no doubt he was linking up with people like uh, General Pitt Rivers and possibly taking advice from them on how to uh, do this advocacy work. He was the first inspector of ancient monuments, um, appointed after passing of the Ancient Monuments Act of 1882. So um, um, he, he, he knew all the right people, I think. Um, and the Reverend Mins here pictured on the right, um, 
he was also heavily involved in all this campaigning. Um, and he was the editor of the proceedings for a long time. So under threat at the same time, um, for the same reason, was what we now call Westgate Hall. Now, a wedding venue, looking very, very mm -hmm. nice in this photograph. Um, but then it was called the guard room, it was a store and it was stables. Uh, we don't think there's any evidence for it having operated as a guard room, but um, at this time, so 1888, 1898, um, it was being used by the owners of West, Westgate House um, in this way, but it had become very neglected and there was a strong likelihood that this was going to get knocked down as well and replaced by housing, but it was saved. And the, the field club campaigned for that too. And they even managed to persuade the council to vote for 50 pounds to repair the roof so that it would be watertight. And this is where we start getting um, references to Reverend Min's fundraising ability, which uh, seems to have been very successful. Um, he raised another hundred pounds for further work from sort of private subscription. Um, and uh, on the condition that the council would take greater care of the building, which uh, I think they did at that point. I mentioned the Bargate. This, this has been under threat so many times. I'm sure 1898 wasn't the first time because other gates around the town were knocked down in the 1700s. Um, very glad that it survived into the late 19th century. Um, but this was a really serious time for the Bargate because um, it was felt to be in the way. Wanted to, um, to have the trams running in a nice straight line down the high street. Mm. And, uh, but the field club leapt into action led by William Dale. Again, this, this was his most, him as an individual, his most high profile campaign, lots in the papers about it. Um, possibly having had success with the Society of Antichrist on saving the Western walls, the field club decided not to make its own representation here, but, they, to, but to encourage others to do it. They wanted to work behind the scenes. Um, they wrote to national bodies, to ask them to use their influence, various learned, learned societies to write in with their objections and encourage local people as well. So national and local individual members of the public to write to the papers and boy, they did. Lots of them in there. Um, and that's where the, my trip to the SPAB archive was quite revealing that the Bargate file, which starts off in the sort of 1870s, I think, is about this thick. I don't think people can, at home can see me at the moment. I'm... It's too big to see. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. This big, thick anyway, uh, full of letters that uh, people wrote to them as well from all sorts of walks of life. It wasn't just the, the sort of same old names. It was lots of individuals, members of the public. And uh, it, it lived to fight uh, another day, but again, <laughs> Again, in 1912, it came under threat again because the parapet, of, you see in both of these photographs, uh, the then picture, the, uh, the black and white one, uh, that parapet on the northern side was starting to collapse and bits were falling off. Uh, so some people were suggesting that the obvious thing was just to take the whole thing down, falling to bits. Um, but Dale went into action again and brought in the new inspector of ancient monuments who assured them that the Bargate would be protected by the new Ancient Monuments Act and he could schedule it within 24 hours notice. So woe betide any attempt to knock it down. But uh, he didn't need to do that then because the council again voted against, dem the full council voted against demolition by a large majority. So it must have been a com transport committee or something that wanted to knock down a small group of people. But when it came to full council, they uh, didn't want to lose it. Um, uh, 
the West Gate didn't appear to be under the same threat of demolition at this time, but it was in dreadful shape. And you can see in the then photograph, there's quite a nasty crack there going running down the middle. Um, there's a rather nice window box on that one, which yeah. isn't there anymore, which is a shame. And a nice pointy roof. Um, and this is where Reverend Mings gets uh, fundraising again. And uh, he raised 160 pounds this time to pay for its repair. Um, and we notice at this time that the borough surveyor probably helped that he was a member of the Hampshire Field Club. Quite a, quite a number of the, um, the sort of key members of staff were members of the field club, so that was a good move too. And several councillors. The ones whose names come up most often are um, Glasspool and Western. And the borough architect, uh, Richard MacDonald Lucas, who was the one who uh, designed the Mayflower Memorial. Um, he was um, also a member of the field club. And what's so nice in those early uh, editions of the proceedings, they list all the members, so it's easy to see who, who was uh, involved, which is great. So we still have the Westgate now, which now has a ex temporary exhibition in by put together by C. Southampton on the Mayflower. A little promotion for them there. Um, the Undercroft, possibly Southampton's nicest vault. Um, this, the field club was very worried about the Undercroft. Um, it's seen in this rather murky photograph on the left. Um, this is in Simnel Street. Um, so they actually, um, send a check for £10 to the council to say, please, can you save the undercroft? And rather suspiciously, um, it was returned. The council clearly had other plans for the undercroft at this stage. Um, and it turned out that they wanted to uh, improve Simnel Street, which even Lucas at this time described him as always having an evil look. <laughs> Um, but this one really had uh, quite a difficult com campaign. It became quite acrimonious. Um, it was played out in the local papers with um, the so-called preservationists um, being the butt of jokes. I don't know what was going on here, but it, it, some of the letters are quite unpleasant. Um, but the Reverend Mins um, defended them forcefully and by saying, the supporters of the old gentleman who dive into ancient history are happily neither few nor unimportant members of the civic body and undaunted by scathing satire. The Pickwickians form a substantial majority. So no messing with Mins. And again, they brought in people from uh, uh, working at a national level. The first commissioner of um, his Majesty's work, Lord Windsor. And interestingly enough, in, in one of his letters, Dale uh, also uses the tourism cards. It seems like a very modern approach. Um, but he had said that the Southwestern Hotel kept a list of ancient monuments in Southampton that they used to give to American visitors because they always wanted to be directed to the best uh, monuments and the Undercroft was always one of these. Um, so eventually, uh, after nine years of campaigning, um, it, they managed to reopen it to the public. So it's ceased to be a dark and musty potato store and became a visitor attraction in 1907. And it's been open regularly ever since although it was used as an air raid shelter like all the others were during the war. Um, but they, they unblocked the windows and it's actually the only um, vault we have in Southampton that's got natural light, which gives it a very pleasant feeling and it's got the most ornate carving inside it. And here we have it, um, Andy Russell being interviewed for a, a TV documentary, which was actually on the Tudors, but they... they <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they, 
the vault would still have been used then, in use then. And it's it's most the most visited of, of all the vaults and the, the guided tours often go into it. Um, I saw a, about 60 school children filing through it today, which was lovely. So, um, not surprisingly, there was a pause of acti in activities during the, the First World War. And then we got a changing of the guard at the field club. Um, many of the original members died around this time. Um, the Reverend Mins in 1918 and uh, St. John Hope, the um, Society of Antiquaries chap, two years later, and then William Dale in 1925. And the focus began to shift towards uh, more rural archaeology, earthworks with people like Williams Freeman and OGS Crawford getting um, more involved in Hampshire archaeology. But the threats to Southampton's medieval buildings didn't go away. Um, the slum clearance was, was still going on at this stage after the First World War. Um, people were still living in some dreadful conditions in uh, just, I've seen some photographs taken in the uh, 1920s in Print Street and the housing really was quite, quite desperate. Um, but they built a new school in 1911 right in the old town, uh, St. John's School, which is still there today, um, and growing all the time. Um, but it was sort of squeezed in between all these uh, uh, houses and uh, was desperate for more place, playground space. So they started to clear the buildings directly around it in French Street. And whilst they would, or, I don't know what the initial prompt was, but um, in the process of announcing which buildings they were going to demolish, um, it was this building, um, which was known as just the medieval hall in the 1930s, was the significance of it was, was revealed. Um, and it is mentioned in the proceedings as being uh, sort of discovered by a chap called Walter Troke. And so I, I looked into him a little bit more. Um, apologies for a moment. Um, he, he was an architect, he was a Southampton boy. He lived in Shirley and he was an architect, but living in London at the time, but he obviously came back to see his family quite frequently because he used to uh, wander around Southampton's old uh, monuments and check up on how they were, were being looked after or not by the council, and then write letters to SPAB, the, the Society of, uh, for the Presentation of Ancient Buildings, um, of, of which he was one of their local members. So that was on a voluntary basis, their membership used to sort of keep an eye on local uh, monuments and uh, keep Spab informed. And he wrote many, many letters, but he was also a member of the field club. So he gets mentioned in proceedings uh, as well. And he spotted this medieval hall and got the experts at Spab to come down and have a look at it. And they got very excited about it and thought it could be the official way house, which from documents we know was in this part of town, in this part of French Street. Because at that time it had a fantastic oak roof. Um, it, it was, the stonework was rendered, as you can see from this photograph, uh, with a steep medieval, medieval roof line. Most of the tiles were still on it and um, quite nicely molded. Uh, wall plates inside it. Um, so they knew this was an important building that should be preserved. And Trope drew some beautiful drawings of it, which we still have in the, um, in the Southampton City Archive. Um, but one of these letters is quite 
one of the letters that he wrote to Spab um, was quite illuminating on Hampshire Field Club. You know, a very indiscreet letter that he marked private and confidential, but I did check with Spab if it was okay to quote a bit from it. But, um, he talks about the time, town clerk at the time as who he said, despite being a member of the Hampshire Field Club, <laughs> but he rarely attends meetings, um, you will only get a grain of sympathy. Um, clearly, this guy didn't have the di diplomatic skills that Dale and Minns had. Uh, uh, those sort of earlier years. Um, I put it down to the enthusiasm of a youth. He actually wasn't very old when he was doing this work. And um, maybe things would have changed as he got older, but sadly he, he was killed in the war. Um, 1934, um, there was a, a field meeting to medieval Southampton, but it was the first official visit since 1916. And they actually said that few members realized range, the range and importance of Southampton's medieval remains. Although there had been a talk about the walls in 1921, which was, a, I think was probably organized by Crawford. Um, so a return to some interest in Southampton's monuments at this stage, the way house was restored, it was saved, um, I don't get the impression that the field club was very involved, apart from through this one member, Walter Troke, was that involved in saving this building. There were others locally who, uh, who uh, particularly the headmistress of the school next door, who worked very hard to save it, and the head of education. Um, and she organised a pageant for its, its opening after it was restored in 1936, I think it was. Um, and the Hampshire Field Club was in, we've, we've still got the invitation lists in the city archive and the, the field club's on that list as being, having been invited, but nobody came. And uh, Walter Trope was on holiday in Yorkshire as well, so he couldn't come either. Um, so a, a slightly less engagement um, at this time. And I mentioned that the Bargate has had many threats to it over the years. They, it happened again in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and there's lots in the press about the various threats to it. Uh, again, it was traffic problems here. They, they wanted to move it out of the way. But um, fortunately, it got uh, scheduled. Thanks to this relatively new legislation, it was protected in 1923, first um, monument in Southampton to be scheduled. Um, but I think this letter, I don't know if you can, can you read that? The letter on the left. I just put this in one, partly because it's such a wonderful signature. Um, Borough Hill, who was very much in, interested in the, um, Southampton's history, just wrote this very short letter, but with, with a signature like that had to be noticed. And he included lots of press cuttings, such as the one you see on the other side here. Oh, no, not with that letter, because it was later on. Um, but the, these are all taken from this very fat file about the bar, bar gate at Spam. Um, but it was decided that, uh, they, they, they would leave the Bargate in situ and turn it into a circus so that they'd have the, the uh, make it turn it into a roundabout so that the trams and the cars would go around it. Um, so the poor old uh, town walls to the left and right of it, the east and west of it, um, came down in the 30s. And I particularly like this press cutting with uh, this uh, group of people, passers by watching this one poor soul standing on the wall that he's demolishing. Um, and this other one, once they started to make the breach through the wall for the new road, and I'm sure that shadowy figure is OGS Crawford. Yeah. 
Um, but but in these campaigns in the 20s and 30s, we we do find very in the stuff I've looked at anyway, and I'm sure there's loads more out there. I haven't found much mention of the field club as an organisation uh, defending a bargate at this stage. Um, but anyway, but it is worth noting by this this time, 1925, all the other monuments uh, that the field club had fought for were scheduled by 1925. But when the monuments uh, really began to suffer again uh, during the Second World War, the field club really rose to the challenge. Um, the newly formed photographic section uh, which was led by Mr. Cade and Dr. Green, whose names you see on the backs of so many old photographs of Southampton. Um, they worked in partnership with the new National Buildings Record to photograph all the historic buildings in the town, um, working alongside OGS Crawford. He was really Southampton's secret weapon at this point. Well, not that secret, I mean, he was a very high profile. He had been transferred from the Ordnance Survey to the National uh, Buildings Record for the duration of the war to take photographs of the town, but he didn't do it on his own. He did it with the field club. Um, and they took over 5,000 photographs, which have all survived. Um, and at this stage, the, these are two examples the Quilter's Vault, which was rebuilt in the 60s and is not open to the public at the moment, but we hope to get it reopened very shortly. It does look a lot better now than it did here. Um, and there, there's a particularly uh, dramatic one of the Way House after it was bombed in 1940, only four years between before it being fully restored and opened as a hall for the school. It, uh, the, that beautiful medieval roof burnt down. Um, very intense fire, I think, not least because they put lots of preservative on the, the timbers, which must have created quite a nice medium. But they, the other thing that happened when uh, these, you, you probably know this, but the um, when a lot of these medieval buildings were, uh, damage during the war, uh, new medieval features were, were revealed, actually. It was almost as if the, the bombs exposed the medieval archaeology. Um, the classic is Hol Holyrood Church, that the Victorian plaster that had concealed lots of medieval features got blown off and revealed all the nice um, masonry features underneath. And the newer buildings built over the medieval vaults, they were destroyed and the much more resilient stonework survived underneath and everyone was there. Uh, and Crawford, Green and Cave were all there with their cameras to record it, which is fantastic. Um, then after the war, war, things went up a gear again. Crawford retired from the National Buildings Record. He decided not to go back to the Ordnance Survey and he became president of the Field Club for two years. And in that first presidential report, he stressed that conservation is the key. He was determined to, to, to do his best to save the sort of remains of the monuments. And uh, he set up the Friends of Old Southampton Society with Elsie Sandell, um, the local historian and writer. Um, and on many of the campaigns around this time, it's, it's, it's that friends group that gets mentioned much more than the field club, but they were having um, joint meetings together. So, um, but I guess the focus was on creating something very local, very focused on Southampton. And they did things like make sure the editor of the Echo was on the committee and the membership was pretty good. And I, by 1947, they had 200 members. Um, but it, the, 
The recording work that was done by the Field Club and Crawford meant that the town council was much better equipped than most towns uh, to plan after the war. I, <laughs> yes, I, I, I couldn't resist putting this memo in, into, the, into the presentation um, just to show how what an impact Crawford in, and the, the others were making locally, written by a member of the um, council staff. They, they'd lost a file, the, the file on the way house. They'd lent it to uh, Mr. Crawford in 1950 because he was going to write an article about the way house. Um, but this was what, four years on, and there was lots in the papers about the way house because that was likely to get clear they didn't even though it was scheduled in 1951 there were threats to that the school needed more space again and there were threats to its its future um, so this particular official wanted that file back um, because he foresee some fun and games um, three ministries at least two societies and lots of pro bono publico and hands off our heritage folk will be joining in the fun <laughs> so that was really nice um, so they were really quite a powerful lobby at this stage, and I think what the telling thing is the impact that they had, particularly Crawford, um, on the post-war reconstruction plans as the um, sort of official town plan that came out in 1954, even had a section on the history and topography of the town that was written by Crawford, which again is quite sort of foresighted. And they managed, or there was a plan to put a new north-south road in um, along the line of what is now Castle Way, which you go down if you pass uh, um, West Quay. It's where it, it goes. They did drive a hole through the, the town wall at that point, but that road is a lot smaller, a lot narrower, and a lot windier than the original plan. They were going to blast a very big road through there, but the campaigning they did at that time um, managed to reduce it in size and alter its route to the point where they, they were going to demolish about 13 historic buildings in the process, but they managed to reduce that to six. And I noticed how it, it sort of goes around St. Michael's Church. It's worth walking down there and see why does this road sort of weave around? That's because Crawford, Friends of South, Old Southampton and the Field Club were making sure that uh, it took the right route. That missing file, in, by the way, they, it did turn up. Um, it's now in the city archive and there's a note in it from Crawford written in his sort of spidery handwriting. So, sorry, <laughs> I found it. <laughs> And he sat on it for five years. It's it's in there actually with lots of letters from the Ministry of Work saying, when are you going to do up the um, the way house? It, you know, what what are you going to do with it? So there's pressure from coming from the national level as well. Um, at this time in the 50s, there was very little money, obviously, to spend on um, Southampton's heritage. But somebody did do all these rather nice uh, sketches. They, were, they didn't have any money to spend on the Way House. They did spend it on a vault next door, which is called the Way House Vault, and managed to open that to the public. Um, but the Way House itself, they actually took some of it down because it was wobbling a bit. And... Uh, plan to put a garden inside. I don't think that ever happened, but it, the school were able to use it to, as a, a playground, but it never got a roof put back on it. So what might, what, we've talked about the things that they saved, but there were one or two things that disappeared. Um, I particularly like this aerial photograph of, um, this is looking east. Um, 
across the top of the western walls towards the site of the castle, um, taken in 1959-60. Um, and there is now a, a very tall um, tower block there, lots home to many. Um, but I, I often fantasize that, um, you know, what, what if they had saved that area and turned it into a park that followed the sort of the the root of the castle walls but maybe that was that's just being too optimistic given that the keep was lost in the 16th century so it might have been a bit too much to ask but um we know that the fragmentary remains of the Southampton's friary were did survive the bombing and they were cleared they they went there's very little of that left and Isaac Watts father's house was was badly damaged and that was cleared too um, however, what go a bit back to the sort of more cheery side of things, um, Mark Webb published an article in Urban History uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2018, and compared Southampton's response to Coventry's to protecting medieval buildings and archaeology during this sort of post-war period and is very positive about um, Southampton's approach. And he put part of that, part of the sex he, uh, success, he put down to the town having an independent watchdog set up by a charismatic and respected champion, i.e. OGS Crawford, um, who, who knew the monuments inside out, having crawled all over them during the war. Um, but I, I would like to argue that Crawford could not have done this quite so successfully without the help of the Hampshire Field Club, because he was building on 50 years of advocacy and recording done by those Field Club members um, who, who were lobbying from the start at a national level. So that's where they implanted that um, seed at a national level of the importance of, of Southampton's archaeology and they worked in partnership with local bodies um, and you know worth remembering again that all those sites that the society lobbied for in those early days were the first to be scheduled the first to be protected um, and I'd, I'd just like to end with this quote here from uh, St. John O'Neill, who was Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments after the war. And he came to a joint meeting that um, the Friends of Old Southampton and the Hampshire Field Club um, organised uh, on the old walls of Southampton. And he said, because I, I looked at the sort of uh, record of that talk, and he said, Southampton walls, of the most impressive and important in Great Britain. And so if you, I'd just like to end, if you haven't walked the walls recently, um, I urge you to, to do so. And, and I just have a look at what people like Dale, Mins, Troke and others, Crawford, Elsie Sandell, what they uh, did for us and so that we can, uh, see how much they say for for our generation and future generations thank you yeah. would anyone like to ask any questions yes what happened to the friends of old I've just had a question. What uh, happened to the Friends of Old Southampton? For the benefit of those listeners at home, um, they they moved from that sort of campaigning role into supporting excavation in the uh, what in the town. Um, I'm not sure that quite how there's what the constitutional changes were, but they became a sort of an excavation committee eventually and um, that was really when digging started uh, in earnest in Southampton after the war um, getting in before the sites were redeveloped 
and they were certainly involved in that. I, I have tried to track, there is a file on them um, in the city archive, but I haven't yet been able to find sort of newsletters or anything like that, but I certainly want to find out more about them. There's a very nice photograph in the uh, Echo, I think it is, of, of their first meeting. And this group um, met outside the Tudor House Museum and sort of marching off earnestly led at the front by Elsie and OGS Crawford and a, a, a small boy. And I'd love to know who that small boy <laughs> grew up to. I, I've got a volunteer who works for me who, who was involved in the excavations at that time. Let's find out whether it's him or not. I don't think it quite works, but uh, I don't think he'd still be helping me now. But it's, it's yes. not really a question, it's just an observation. I love seeing the photographs of Bargate with the trams going through the centre. Mm -hmm. I think they had to design the trams especially to be able mm -hmm. to get through that narrow opening. And with them being open top uh, trams, I wonder what it was like being a passenger sitting on the <laughs> top deck. <laughs> if you just didn't know Bargate, did you have to duck? I, I should think it was quite unnerving as they approached the bar gate because um, they actually dug down the level of the ground. So oh, I do wonder whether it sort of went like a fairground ride yeah. underneath. Um, didn't The cables didn't quite clear the stonework because you can see the sort of grooves where they mm. uh, yes. damaged those. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it was prob probably a good thing in the end they went round mm. rather than through. So, the, the, the question is, those uh, gates into Southampton that were demolished in the 1700s, what, what scale were they at? I, I don't know a great deal about it, but I think Bargate was always the biggest and the best and the grandest, um, not least because it was the Guildhall and the, mm. uh, a significant public building in its own right. Um, the East Gate, uh, it, it was probably somewhere in between the Bar Gate and the West Gate, West Gate being quite small, um, but was little cars used to go through the West Gate until so they put a... Yes, there are some, it, yes, yes, fortunately somebody did some, uh, some engravings exist, or certainly of that one. And there are also some engravings of the South Gate, which was known as the Water Gate. Um, on the west side, there was Biddle's Gate, which came down in 1895, I think. So there are plenty of, of illustrations of that, I think. Um, thank you. So if that's... Um, oh. Shall we end there and say good night? <laughs> oh, last one. My thanks to all those for allowing me to use their photo images. Okay, well, good night, everybody. And, uh, thank you for. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I didn't quite manage to. <laughs> Right, well, thank you very much and thank you for coming this evening.